And so I'm going to introduce Dr. David Braniatowski, who is the Associate Professor of GW Engineering, and he's also GW Site Lead for the NIST NSF Trustworthy AI Institute for Law and Society, aka TRAILS. Okay, thank you all very much, and uh, thank you for coming for your, uh, for your continued attention. Um, the name of this panel is Data as a Civics Issue, and indeed, it's increasingly apparent that the impact of data governance on civil society is, is quite profound. Uh, the questions uh, become things like how should our institutions respond and what governance strategies can and should be brought to bear in a society that we wish to live in. So here to discuss these questions, uh, we have Janet Haven, who is the Executive Director of Data and Society. She has worked at the intersection of technology policy, governance, and accountability for more than 20 years, both domestically and internationally. She's a member of the National AI Advisory Committee, which advises President Biden and the National AI Initiative Office on a range of issues related to artificial intelligence. She also acts as an advisor to Trust and Safety, to the Trust and Safety Foundation, and has brought her expertise in nonprofit governance to bear through various different board memberships. Janet, do you want to say a few quick words about yourself and your organization? It's on. It's on now. This is on, right? Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to great to see you all here. Um, just, I'll just say a few words. Thank you for introducing me. A few words about my organization. I run an, an, a nonprofit, independent nonprofit called um, Data and Society. We are a research institute. Um, we also do policy work and we focus on the social and political and cultural implications of data-centric technologies and automation and AI. Um, we primarily work through the lens of the social sciences. So we are we are not um, computer scientists. We're, we're not even computational social scientists for the most part. Um, we are ethnographers and our sort of core argument is that um, the the experiences of people as they um, use and work alongside technology uh, is critical to understand, and particularly in the governance and policy making space. Thank you very much. Uh, it is also my pleasure to introduce Jenny Tennyson, who is the founder and executive director of Connected by Data, a campaign that aims to give communities a powerful voice in decisions about data and AI. She is co-chair of the Data Governance Working Group within the Global Partnership on AI, and you may also know her from her days at Open Data Institute, where she was the CEO. Uh, Jenny, would you like to say a few quick words? Sure. Um, so just to introduce uh, a, a bit about um, Connected by Data is, is my organization. So that was set up about 18 months ago, and it was after working in the in the data and data governance field for <laughs> a long time, <laughs> so it's, uh, similarly to Janet. Um, and getting a bit frustrated with uh, conversations that we have around data governance that always seem to end with the, the uh, realization that the public should be more involved in these kinds of conversations. Um, but that not actually being mapped into what actually happens in, in practice. And so we identified like three strands of, of work that really wanted to focus on. One was about narratives. We've already talked a little bit about metaphors and the kind of ways in which we talk about um, data. So, so ensuring that uh, there's more attention on um, uh, kind of collective approaches to data governance in the way that we talk about it in particular in the media. Um, second is around practice. We've already also talked about the kind of resource intensivity of involving the, the public. We need to develop better me mechanisms in order to do that. So that was the second area of, of, of work. And then finally, around policy and policy development. We're a UK organisation, so we work primarily in the, um, in the UK, but also try to connect to uh, organisations around the world that are doing very similar kinds of things. Thank you very much. Uh, so with that, I think we will uh, jump straight into our questions. Uh, and we'll start out by just asking, uh, to what extent do you think that data governance is a useful tool for governing generative AI? Uh, Jenny, if you'd like to give a few thoughts about that. Sure. So I thought it would be um, a, a interesting to maybe start with what do we mean by data governance in a, in a kind of academic audience. You have to you know define your terms, that kind of thing. Um, 
So the way that I think about it is how we make decisions about data, how we make decisions about what gets collected, how it gets used, how it gets categorized, um, when it gets deleted, who has access to it, how it's filtered, how it's processed. All of those kinds of decisions come under the kind of governance structures that we need to put in place around, uh, around data. Um, so when we think about that, uh, for in a in a generative AI context, I find that quite a lot of the time we, we're really focused on um, what that means around training data, and a lot of the conversation that we've had is is has been focused on that. And in some ways, you can see why that would be, because data is the is the lifeblood of these kinds of systems. You know, if we turned off the ability to access data um, to, to build generative AI, then we turn off AI, right? So it's incredibly powerful from that from that perspective. Um, but on on the other hand, uh, I think that you know ways in which we address the way in which data gets used within those systems, doesn't tackle a whole bunch of the issues that we have around generative AI. So it's not a very powerful tool when it comes to looking at job losses or job replacement or what good work means, for example. It's not a great tool, really, when it comes to environmental concerns and the energy usage of, of, uh, of generative AI systems. Um, it's not a fantastic tool when we look at corporate power and monopolies. Um, and uh, and the kind of access to essential services. And I think that, that um, generative AI will become an essential service. Um, uh, it's not fantastic at, my, uh, data governance isn't a fantastic tool when it comes to things like misinformation or phishing or revenge porn or those kinds of places in which data, uh, the, the generative AI gets used and has those kinds of harms. Um, we've also talked uh, over the last couple of days about uh, about accuracy in the outputs of generative AI. Um, and I think I, I heard two different arguments around that, about whether more whether using more accurate data would lead to more accurate out, um, outputs from generative AI, or whether by the very definition of the way in which generative AI works, we're always going to have hallucinations and falsehoods coming out of it. And I'm, I'm not sure at the moment. Um, I, I think that, I, th I think that, uh, there needs to, there will be more attention on getting better accuracy, which where data might have a, a big role to play in that. Um, I think also uh, around bias, we often talk about being able to control, uh, get more representative data in order to control bias in the kind of generative AI outputs. Again, I'm not quite so sure about that, just because the way in which generative AI works is a stereotype engine, right? It goes to the average. It goes to, you have to be quite, work quite hard in order to get generative AI to, to um, be more diverse in its outputs. And I'm not sure that just fixing the, the inputs is going to address that. But um, again, I, I welcome thoughts on that. So basically data governance only addresses, particularly of the input data, the training data rather that we, that we use only addresses some of those kinds of issues. Um, but I also think we, we should be thinking about applying data governance to things other than training data. We've already talked about some of those. So metadata about the data that is being used or metadata about models is stuff that we should have some say over who gets access to, what the transparency is around metadata, you know, through data sheets, through model cards, through kind of provenance trails and all of those kinds of things. Um, but we can also use access to data and transparency around data as mechanisms for addressing some of those things that I said couldn't be addressed, right? So for example, data, um, somebody talked about data about the use of services, the use of say GPT, who is using it for what kinds of purposes, what kinds of prompts are they using within it? Um, that provides currently a competitive advantage to those services that are providing that, that are being provided and means that they're able to get into an even more advantageous position. Um, but if we opened that up, if there was more information about that, that's a place where we can start to address, say, say competition concerns. Maybe we can look at 
getting organizations to publish uh, data about energy use in order to try and act, um, address some of the environmental concerns. Maybe, uh, and we definitely need to have more data published and available and, and, and made more transparent about when AI is being used in particular contexts. Uh, you know, so in the workplace, we need to be able to know when generative AI and other kinds of AI are being used in ways that affect the workers. So uh, I think that we need to, when we're looking at data governance as, an AI, as a mechanism for kind of doing AI governance around, around generative AI, um, we, ought to, we need to be aware of the limitations of that, but also be aware of the way in which we can use data as a tool in order to address some of those larger issues. Thank you very much, Jenny. And, and uh, a lot of what I'm hearing from you um, pertains not uh, not only to the benefits and limitations of data governance, but the ways in which that governance is really embedded within a larger system or a larger uh, larger framework that touches on a lot of different policy issues. Janet, I'm wondering if you might be willing to uh, talk a little bit to address the same question, but also talk about how you see this fitting into that larger picture. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, I, I mean, I think to... I would start by saying that data governance is absolutely a critical issue in, in governing AI and generative AI. Um, and, you know, the degree to which separating those two things is useful, I think is, you know, is, a, is an open conversation. Um, but I will say that, that the issues of data governance um, show up in all of the major policy frameworks that we've seen come out over the past um, over the past few months, including the, or year even, including the AI Bill of Rights, the AI Executive Order, the um, draft OMB memo, um, and the AI Risk Management Framework. So all of them have um, elements that address data governance, but they're not comprehensive and they are somewhat buried and they aren't called data governance. And so that, that I think is one issue that I think we'll talk more about, which is the kind of storytelling and um, you know messaging around around the issues that the data governance community cares about. Um, so I, you know, I've I've worked on. Did I just turn that off? Yeah. Um, so I've I've worked you know in and around governance, technology governance spaces for for a couple of decades, and so I thought one of the things that would be useful to do would. Be to, to to think about this in the broader um, governance context, and so I think you know one of the one of the issues I see with thinking about data governance as a tool for um, in within AI governance is that governance has to be treated as an ecosystem. It isn't a this not that question. It's a question of what are along the entire life cycle of an AI system, for instance, or um, an AI, you know, supply chain. What are the what are the accountability and governance mechanisms that need to be in place um, to create a whole set of accountability controls? And so, I think in that context, data governance is is extremely um, critical. But I also think it's important to say that at the at the output side, we need you know rights protecting um, regulation that addresses the outcomes of these systems in society that produce harms and the mechanisms for mitigation of those harms or redress of those harms, particularly for um, historically marginalized or vulnerable populations that are more likely to be um, subject to, to those kinds of harms from AI systems, as we've seen from extensive empirical research. Um, so that's that's one thing is just thinking about this in the context of this broader ecosystem of governance and what are all the pieces we need to consider. The second thing I would say that I think is critical is um, is that governance is is iterative, right? Like it's something that is doesn't happen at a single moment, but that is always evolving. And there are always um, going to be different points of opportunity to translate um, critical research or critical ideas for solutions around data governance into active policymaking. And so I think a, 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 an important piece of this discussion around data governance and how it fits into the kind of overall AI governance framework is 
you know, what are the points of intervention and what can you anticipate as a really important place for this community to show up and to push the kinds of ideas that you want to see in the regulations and um, possible legislation that are forthcoming. Um, I think another another issue to think about in terms of data governance and um, and and the governance environment we're in now is that I think maybe you know more so than any any other area that I've seen, um, AI governance conversations tend to be focused around these sort of silver bullet ideas, like we just need to do this thing and then it's going to be great. Um, and and that is both not true, but going back to the idea of an ecosystem, but it also I think makes it really hard to have a data governance conversation because there are so many points of entry, right? There are so many um, different places where data governance is important along the, the, the spectrum. Um, and I guess the, the last thing I'll say about this is that you know, I think that the current moment in in AI governance is, um, you know, for for better and for worse, driven by um, human centered fears, and um, and those are fears. You know, I think there's a real fear that we've seen drive um, drive a lot of the conversation around competition with China and a potential, um, even potential uh, actual conflict with China, and and that is that is something I think a lot of people worry about very very seriously. Um, and then we also see that a lot of the conversation is driven by concern about risks to people. Um, short-term, what are considered short-term risks, or I would say immediate harms, um, where we see, um, you know, we see real concerns about the use of AI and algorithmic systems in um, in the criminal justice system, uh, impacting equity, and all the whole the whole list that Jenny uh, mentioned, and the impact on workers and other areas. So those are those are immediate harms, and I think it's very um, it's compelling. Um, to focus on those as well as it is it is true and again empirically backed. And then I think other parts of this conversation have um, you know have been um, focused on on you know what what are called existential risks and the this sort of somewhat sci-fi idea that you know AI will rise up and and wipe out humanity, which is does not have an empirical um, basis for, being concerned about, but I think is also a very galvanizing idea, and it means that policymakers get, you know, really worried that they're missing something, and and that you know there's a risk of doing nothing. And I'm not sure that that urgency exists in the same way in the data governance conversation. And so I think that ways to connect um, to those kinds of, um, you know, very you know immediate and and you know highly felt harms um, and concerns is is probably very important. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm what I'm hearing is that there's really um, quite a few challenges that we're facing uh, in terms of data governance, uh, especially as it applies to generative AI. Some of those come from disagreements about, uh, but also a wide range of different risks. Uh, some of those come from uh, the fact that uh, we're touching on a lot of different communities and a lot of different existing policy areas. I was wondering whether uh, whether you could both speak a little bit to what the gaps and challenges are in data governance as they apply to generative AI and how that might uh, pertain especially to, uh, to uh, some of these uh, topics that we brought up. Jenny, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um so I'm going to, I'll focus on areas where I think that our kind of frameworks for thinking about rights and interests around data are currently kind of not set up to tackle the kinds of risks and challenges that we that we see around, uh, around generative AI. And there are three areas for this. So the first area is around, we've talked about this already a, a bit, around copyright and the way in which copyright works. Um, uh, one thing that gets missed in these conversations frequently is the fact that the copyright holders are commonly not the original creators of pieces of work, right? So that means, you know, it, it means like big movie studios will own copyright rather than rather than actors, for example, or writers, or it means that big publishers will own it rather than the the authors of a, of uh, a particular 
a scientific article, for example. Um, and, and we use we use copyright as our mechanism for it, when we're when we're talking about generative AI as our mechanism for saying you know how do we get recompense back to creators so that they can keep on creating because we recognise that creation is a and creative output is an important part of our society. So the 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 thing that we want to see happen is for those creators to be able to continue having their livelihoods to be able to continue creating human generated works, right? Um, but copyright isn't necessarily the mechanism through which those creators get to keep their jobs. We've got, um, we, we did a piece of work specifically looking at the uh, uh, impacts on workers. And one of the sets of workers that we looked at was that it were people who were say doing voiceover, voice artists, right? In the creative industry. And it is extremely typical in that environment that they sign away all rights to any kind of recording that is made, including like ones around it being um, it being used in order to obviously to, to train staff. Um, and uh, and because they're in a position where they can't push back against that and because all of those rights are transferable, right? That's the way in which those rights are set up that you can transfer them. So I think we need to have a, a lot of a deeper conversation about the kinds of rights that are necessary for creatives to continue to have moral rights, performance rights, which are not currently harmonized internationally um, in order to get to the, out, the outcome that we want, which is creators to be able to continue to, to, to work and to promote creativity overall. Um, that includes things like really about tackling issues like um, what rights do we have over our style being replicated? So if we're a particular artist, new artworks being created in our style, which currently are not really covered uh, are in copyright. So there's a there's a really good series of, of blogs on the Creative Commons website about that kind of style and how we manage that. So there's a set of rights there that I think we need to dig into a, a bit more around creative works. Second thing... <laughs> Sorry, uh, is is around um, around how we feel about data that originates from us being used by others and get and others getting value from it and profit from it, um, even when we are not, well, even when we have signed over a copyright or even when it uh, when we're talking about personal data, even when that's been de-identified or anonymized. We have a we have a, a tradition of really looking at personal data as being only data that in, in, uh, really identifies you, and that um, the kinds of impacts that personal data can have being about um, the individual privacy harms that come from that. However, the way people feel about data that originates from them. So for example, health data that comes from them is that even if their identifiers are stripped away, it is still in some way theirs, ethically theirs, right? And tackling that, tackling that um, feeling of sovereignty or feeling of uh, a need to assert some rights over, over data that we do not have the legal frameworks for recognizing rights over, um, particularly around that that personal data, non-personal data distinction is something that I think we really need to dig into and address. And the third area is around collective rights. So um, we have, again, a very in our traditional way of thinking about, uh, about rights around data, we think of privacy rights around specific information about us, and we think about copyright around information that we have actually created. Um, but many of the impacts that come out of data and AI systems are felt at group levels and at society levels. And we don't have good frameworks for asserting those rights that we feel at a group level or at a society level. Um, so there's a very good paper by Natalie Smuha that I'd, uh, I'd point to around the kind of ways in which collective rights, uh, that we need to have collective rights. So th there's these three areas which I'm happy to Rant about it at more length, um, where I really think that we need to have more attention on what our legal frameworks look like in order to address the kind of issues and challenges that we're seeing right now. Thank you so much, uh, Janet. Given the uh, the individual and community uh, possibilities for for harm uh, that Jenny just raised, as well as some of the different uh, 
sorts of risks that you mentioned in your previous comment. What do you think the gaps and challenges are here? Thanks. Um, well, I, I I agree with everything Jenny said, unsurprisingly. Um, and I so I I'm going to talk a little bit. I think about the the sort of procedural side of um, building on building on the substance that Jenny put forward. Um, so I I think that you know, and I think we'll get to this in, in the next question, but I think particularly at this moment where there's a lot of opportunity in the policymaking space in, I think, in both Europe and, and in the United States, um, that one thing that's really important to get to in this community are a set of focused priorities and um, a, a a um, somewhat cohesive policy strategy or coordinated policy strategy to move those priorities forward. But I think that to be able to do that, there are a couple of um, there are a couple of things that are that are missing um, that are really important. One of those is the support for um, translation between research and policy. And I think you know that's that's something that we have experimented with at Data and Society, um, and it it is um, it's complicated. Um, it they are they are very different skill sets to do rigorous and um, and important research, and and then to take that research and your findings and move them into the kinds of um, the kinds of formats and and delivery mechanisms, I guess you would say that. Um, policymakers can receive and work with and take action on. And, and so I think one of the things that we really need to see are the funders in this space um, supporting that translational effort. Um, I think that can happen within uh, institutions that already exist. Um, that's, that's what we've done at Data and Society. But I think there's also space for um, you know, specialist organizations in our in our field that um, are really focused on doing that translational and policy delivery work. Um, so that that I think is really critical. I will also say it's you know it's it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's not something that just happens by chance where you know a researcher um, you know shows up in Congress and testifies and that's enough. It is an iterative and continuing process. And, um, and so I, that's, that I think is a really critical missing piece of infrastructure in broadly in, in the governance field for technology and for AI. The second thing I think that goes really hand in hand with that um, is messaging and communications work um, that we really need to be telling better stories um, and, and to be able to communicate those stories, as I said earlier, in ways that, you know, create the kind of urgency that leads to action. Um, and, and I think, again, that is something I think funders in this field could be supporting more of and could be, um, you know, could be thinking about how to couple to that policy translation effort, because those two things are really a virtuous circle that, um, that need to work together. Please. Can I just add something to that? So, so you know, um, setting up uh, Connected by Data was one of those is one of those kinds of organisations as I as I described. You know, trying to map between what I was seeing in the in the uh, research space into campaigning action, um, uh, which I've learned a lot about. And one of the things that has been a, an interesting learning from, from doing that is there are a bunch of organizations in civil society who are acting in those ways who are very specialized around data and digital rights and know that field very, very well. But there's also a bunch of organizations who are working around social justice issues, you know, um, migrant justice, uh, worker justice and, and, and union uh, organizing and so forth. And it's not just the, I think, the, the mapping of the research and stuff into, into policymaking thinking. It's also bringing those other civil society organizations that are more broadly working around um, social justice issues to understand the way in which data and AI is going to have an impact on the, the communities that they're representing right now um, and, and to equip them to be asking for the right things and, and to, to be advocating for their, for their population. So this is absolutely wonderful and I think uh, it gives us a lot to, to think about and, um, and to talk, talk about uh, during the upcoming lunch. 
Um, but I was wondering if we could uh, sort of get your closing thoughts on what does the future hold and where should we focus our efforts around data governance, uh, both domestically and internationally? Janet, do you want to take this one first? Sure. Um, so, I, I mean, speaking very practically, 2024 is going to be a, a busy year in um, AI-related policymaking. Um, I, I know the United States better than, than Europe and, and other parts of the world, so I'm just going to talk about that. But I think that um, there are many opportunities for the data governance community to show up in, and, and, to, and to push critical priorities in, um, in some of the, the work that's going to be happening over, over the coming year and a couple of things I'll just mention very quickly. Um, so I, I so I think as as everyone probably is aware, the um, the executive order on AI came out uh, in early November. Um, it has a lot in it. It's 120 pages. Um, and a lot of what is in there directs agencies to um, essentially figure out different pieces of AI governance. And so that, and, and, you know, sort of gives timelines for that. And so that creates an opportunity for, um, for just about anybody who cares about a particular issue to show up and, um, you know, offer input and offer suggestions into, you know, what is really important in a particular area. And I think because this is happening at, at the agency level, it also uh, provides the opportunity to, to really contextualize in a particular area or a particular set of concerns or harms that your organization, you know, or, or research might focus on. So I think that's that's a um, that's a big big opportunity. And I would say maybe one additional thing about the EO is that it also particularly directs agencies um, with civil rights uh, divisions to understand what it means to protect civil rights within the context of an AI environment. In other words, how to understand and apply um, enforcement around uh, algorithmic discrimination. And so that is um, that is a that is a big, I, I think important shift that we're going to see that agencies will be empowered to to use the powers that they have um, to protect American civil rights. Um, I think a second thing that I, I'll, I'll mention three things. The second thing I want to mention is in the accompanying OMB draft memo that came out alongside the EO that directs the government, essentially how they, the government agencies, federal agencies, how they can use AI. Um, a sort of future looking part of it is procurement. And so OMB is directed to define how procurement will happen in an AI. Um, environment. This is a huge opportunity. Procurement is a gigantic lever, um, particularly around data governance. And so I think that is that is an area that I, I really um, I hope I hope we all are are paying attention to. And then I think the third area that um, that is that is really interesting is that the um, you know we we do expect to see legislation um, proposed in the coming months. Uh, the AI insight forums that um, that Senator Schumer, Heinrich, Rounds, and Young were, have been running through the fall wrapped up on Tuesday. They're now done. Their staffers are going off and drafting legislation. So now, now is the time. If um, if you want to see um, particular elements of data governance in that legislation, it is a very, very, very good time to. Um, to put forward those ideas in ways that are actionable in legislation. Jenny, would you like to um, answer as well? Yeah, sure. So f future opportunities, I, I'll, I'll pull out two. So one is that um, I think that what we're going to see over the over the next few years is is more atten less attention on the development of the foundation models, which are kind of there and more attention on how we do fine tuning, how we do, um, how we do the kind of synthetic data generation that we heard about yesterday, um, how we embed these kinds of tools into our workplaces, into our hospitals, into our schools and so on. And so that means that um, while these like big high level international and national kinds of conversations are going on, 
We also have a real opportunity to have conversations at a very local level within our local communities, within our workplaces, within our schools, about how we want to see these technologies embedded in this particular context. Because context really matters when it comes to the way in which technology is, is adopted. And it really matters about, and that's you know one of the things that governance gives us is the ability to take into account context um, when deciding what kinds of rules uh, need to be put into place. So, you know, uh, this includes having professional bodies, regulators, actually thinking about what the, what generative AI means in their particular context. But I would put it right down to the very local level of campaigning and and conversations at uh, within particular organisations. And I think that that you know um, the 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 fact that we're going to be fine tuning these models means that we're talking about. Um, you know, particular data in a particular workplace being used in order to to uh, in order to refine those models. So that means that the people in that workplace have a have a, a right and a say over those things. So local organising, I think, is a really important thing. The other one, and I'm going off script from what we discussed, um, is that. Um, is that we have a whole bunch of elections coming up next year in the UK and we have an election, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, <laughs> and uh, one, of, uh, one of the things that I think is a, is a problem in this space is that we're not seeing data and AI as a political issue when it is, right? There are winners and losers out of these technologies. And as a government, you have to decide whose side you're on with, the, with these. So we, sorry, go exercised about this one time um so we have to see it as a political issue and we need to see our representatives our politicians actually arguing it as a political issue i don't think that that's come home to many politicians i think that most politicians are seeing this as a technocratic thing and they're largely spouting the same kind of messages around the need for innovation and and human centered oh blah 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 right but it is a it it is a political issue and how you set up the kind of governance and controls that you put around it, who gets to have a say and how really matters. Um, so that I think is an opportunity as we go into an election year, getting our political representatives to recognize that. Wonderful. So I uh, am being informed that we have time for one or two questions. You can stay. We can make the lunch, you know, 45 minutes instead of an hour or so. Um, Three or four questions. <laughs> Does everyone else agree with that? <laughs> I'm Brian Pendleton with AI Risk and Vulnerability Alliance. Um, you talked about moving um, research to politicians. What about the other way? It, making sure that what we're researching is what they need to work on the policies that they're interested in. Um, Yes, I think that is true. Although I, I guess I I start from the um, from the assumption that um, that the role of of academia and research communities and civil society is to raise uh, the issues that may not be front and center for um, for you know politicians who are policymakers. And I will also say I. I think it's really critical because of the um, enormous concentration of power, money, compute, and talent in the uh, in the AI industry that has so successfully lobbied and set the agenda of um, Washington now. So, yeah, <laughs> we yes, absolutely. I think that that two way exchange is really important, but. Um, but I think that that getting the priorities uh, that are coming from an empirical basis and from a, a civil society basis front and center is really critical. Please. Go next. Um, I, I have a question for both of you. Um, I feel there are sort of two strands or tribes in activism on these issues. They're not often named because I think that might suggest there's some kind of a split, but I want to argue there's like a open or commons based activism and there's digital rights activism. Do you think they go like hand in hand together or do we need to do translation work between these two communities as well? 
Um, uh, so, so I, I uh, traditionally, yeah, as you know, Alec, come from the open space. So that's my that's my traditional tribe. But the um, uh, one of the things that I observe about actually the open uh, data and open movement more generally is that we're some of the most rights respecting um, kinds of organizations and thinkers as well, because we, you know, the, the fact that we care so much about people licensing stuff openly is because we respect the fact that they have control over it, right? That they have rights over it. Um, and so I don't see, I, 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 uh, I have, um, I, I think that they're often set up as being in opposition, like the the privacy rights, digital rights, that kind of activism and open kind of activism. In my experience, um, there is a huge gray area about the decisions that we need to make around the, the balances that we need to make around uh, openness and around rights, res uh, the respect of rights where everybody recognizes that there's nuanced decisions to be made. And it's not, it's not that there's one pulling in one direction, one in the other, it's that, that there's a recognized, that there's recognized need for nuance. So I don't think it's helpful to really think of it in, in, as, a, as a split. The one exception to that is that um, I think that the way in which we move forward uh, it, as I said, you know, this is a political issue and we do have different values that we're embedding into our arguments and this discourse and the way in which we make these arguments with each other and explore this space is 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 part of how this is a, a political issue. So, you know, it, it, in some ways, then it is useful to have those extremes so that we can have those arguments and so that we can represent those different kinds of values and views. Um, so I think in reality, then there's a lot more overlap but I think actually it's kind of sometimes useful to be on the extreme side in order to try and pull things in order to try and have those like uh, to really explore the design space that we've got around how we how we move forward. Yeah. Jerry Case, research engineer. I um I think the political part, yeah, is just the distraction. I think that I in order to, for us to get the highest output in, I mean input in terms of really high innovation and then even tons of blunder and failure. I mean, we have now an opportunity for every single person to now recreate this new society. Whether you're coming from jail or you're in fourth grade or you're living in the South Bronx or you're super rich, every single person is a data point now. And I don't think we're taking advantage of uh, bringing all of these people together in innovation excellence hubs that help us with interoperability and research and competition at one time. Uh, I think it's going to take us years to figure out values and DNI and, and coming together at the right place. It's just not going to happen. I think you just got to get all these unique people together, different demographics and one building and just started creating a new society. Because that's what engineers do. We don't wait for the science. We we look at this at National Academy of Science. We don't wait for the science to build the technology or, or find an answer. We do the engineering, and then we'll figure out the science later. Or sometimes in, in great engineering feats, we don't. We still don't know what the science really is. But we were able to get the technology built. Um, well, I suppose uh, speaking as the uh, as the engineer sitting up here in in, in the front, um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, that we are uh, uh, experiencing now, sort of as a society, uh, is um, really what happens when you have technology that's being developed uh, and the uh, participation of a lot of different groups uh, is not uh, being explicitly. Uh, respected or at least not being explicitly called out. And so I think it becomes a big open question for us. And, you know, I would, I would sort of ask the question um, to, to, uh, to the, the group here, um, to what extent in, in, in your experience has it been that people feel like there's been uh, that, that participation and what are the possible consequences uh, of the levels of participation that we've seen uh, up till now? Yeah, I um 
I mean, I, I guess, I guess the, the way that I would think about that, this, that conversation overall, this conversation overall is that I don't, um, I think participation, broad participation is very critical in, uh, in design and, and governance of AI systems. But I also think that it is not, um, I, I don't know. I don't agree with the premise that innovation and uh, regulation are in conflict with each other. I think that um, innovation is uh, is something that we can guide to using regulation towards a set of societal values that you know I think are uh, are fundamental. And I, I you know I go back to rights respecting approaches as the as the core um fundamental uh that we that we should be focused on and i think that if we were to set that as our innovation framework how do um how does the united states using regulation or how how does europe using regulation create an innovation environment that rewards um uh you know development in that direction um, I think we would be on the right path. Okay, um, I think uh, we maybe have time for one more. I, I have a quick question here. And again, it goes to the framing. Um, I, I was at Bloomberg 10 years ago when the last time we had any discussion about data policy, and that's because we were focused on big data. And, and for, for one year, data scientist was the sexiest job title you could have. And then it faded away. My question for you is, is there a way we can get away from using chat GPT as our case study? Because I'm worried that we're not going to write good policy for the Internet of Things. We're not going to focus on real-time data. We're going to assume that all the data lives in a giant data ocean at three or four companies, when in actuality, we need policies that work across the board. I've coined the incredibly unpopular Hashtag Biff Mud. <laughs> Big, fast, fat, missy, unstructured, distributed data. Because that's what we have to address. So, how do we get away from just writing legislation for Chat GPT, which is exactly what the European Union is doing right now? I'm sorry, just so we have two questions and that's it. Sure, sure. Okay. Why don't you quickly ask your question? Yeah, I'm going to do it okay. there. <laughs> Everybody wants a <laughs> I, I'll try to be fast unless um, the gentleman is going first. Yes. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I think hasn't quite come up yet is that in order to feed generative AI um, with the data that it needs, it's going to result either automatically or piece by piece in interoperability of systems or connection of systems. So I'm curious from both your perspectives and your organization's perspectives, how are you thinking about demystifying interoperability um, as a specific issue, knowing that connection of systems further muddies the gap between individuals and their, and their ability to own and shape their data? That is a good, that is a good question. I'm not sure I have an answer answer to that at the moment I, I think that there's um there's a bit about interoperability this is about standards development and there's about how we how we create that and we talked uh, you know a bit earlier on about kind of multi-stakeholder um involvement in standards development to ensure that that we get systems that can be reused in multiple different ways which i think is part of the point of, of interoperability um we also ought to pick up on the how do we how do we stop writing legislation around chat gpt right right now i mean this is a um, it, it's, it's one of those things, you know, um, Janet's talked about how do we campaign to, in a way that hook, hooks into the current uh, zeitgeist and gets people interested in what is otherwise a very, very dull topic around data governance. Um, and, and, you know, for, for me, talking about data infrastructure and all of these kinds of things over years, you know, I know people's eyes just glaze over when you talk about this this stuff. I think we, we have to, uh, I, I think it's behoven us to tap into that zeitgeist because we have to, because that's how we get attention. 
but also to keep in mind those wider and bigger topics because it, it's also not just you know it's not it's not just about generative ai it's not it's right it's not just about chat gpt it's not just about generative ai it's not just about ai more generally it's about every kind of use of data right that which we're, we're talking about that that's our actual goal that we have to be that we have to be looking at but i think it is useful to you know you have to sprinkle on whatever the the um current uh, zeitgeist is in order to get attention and, and 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 also i think that there's a real opportunity because chat gpt has captured so much public and, uh, and political imagination to start to uh, and and understanding like the understanding of of that ai is something that it exists that there there is such a thing um is is a lot more prevalent now amongst the public than previously and it means that that gives us an opportunity to have those conversations Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you so much. And so lunch is outside, but we're going to reconvene exactly at one, if you don't mind. And, um, and then we'll have our last panel. And I know people have to go for flights or trains or buses or whatever. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you back at one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I know he's up there. Yeah, okay, okay. So I don't have Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Research.